You ready, Dave? Ready. Politic 3 program is reinstated. Open sesame! <laughs> Commander Klingon vessel. We are energizing transport of evil. Now. Hello, welcome everyone to Star Trek from the Holodeck. This is the Picard edition, and I'm your host, Michael Flores, and at the science console is David. Hello, Dave. I have vitals on uh, Jerry Ryan, Captain. Jer- Jerry Ryan? <laughs> Come on, Dave. That makes well, I think it- they're vitals. They might be news. Oh, that makes it creepy. Let's, <laughs> let's stick to the, the areas of fiction. Let's just call our seven of nine. <laughs> Let's just say you have vitals on seven of nine. Ah, okay. Yeah. If we okay. start throwing out real people's names, it becomes muddy and confusing. And <laughs> or, are... or maybe Jerry Ryan would be like, these guys sound sexy. I'm going to send a message to them. That would, that awesome. would never happen, David. <laughs> don't, don't fucking fool yourself. <laughs> hey, how about Whoopi Goldberg? I mean, I, I don't mind. I mean, <laughs> come on. <laughs> come on. I think if I got hit on by Whoopi Goldberg, I would notch that. I would absolutely go, Jesus greatest Christ. moment in my life. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Jesus, David, shut up. <laughs> shut up. <laughs> okay, let's get into today's discussion. If you are a new listener, we cover a wide variety of Star Trek content, and you can find our podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. Just search Star Trek from the holodeck. Okay, so this episode, David, was directed by Leah Thompson, and yes, that is of Back to the Future yes, fame. Yes, it is. If people are unaware, she is actually a force to be reckoned with from the TV front. She yeah. is now a legitimate TV director with director. with <clears throat> dozens of episodes of television under her belt. And for the most part, she does a pretty damn good job with the things that she directs. So oh, yeah. no problems there. The episode was written by Kylie Rossetter and Christopher Monfetti. Okay, Dave, so Picard... The Picard team heads to the 21st century on a mission to find the Watcher. We still don't know who or what that is, but their goal is to stop the time incursion that changes the Federation to the Confederation. Uh, Though this episode did slow things down a bit, it was a needed aspect, I want to say, to allow some of the smoke to settle where we see the writing team get to work fleshing out some of our characters, which was needed. It's been pretty much balls to the wall the first two episodes, and for them to take a step back, slow things down, and allow certain things that they've introduced to marinate, yes, to simmer just a bit, I think that's definitely a welcome. Uh, Some people were complaining that it was slow. I disagree. From the complaint side, I felt like, yes, you could say the pacing was slower, but that's not necessarily a negative. No, it's not. I mean, you have to, people have to understand this is television. This is called television writing. You need to have episodes that slow down the pace, kind of give us a chance to breathe, and then they'll ramp it up again. But they have to establish certain elements still within the season. And yeah, they've established a lot for the past two episodes. Absolutely a lot. They they do. They've ran us through a lot of Oops. plot points. But like now that they're in a different quote unquote setting, they have to establish that setting. Exactly. You know, it, we, while in we, Star Trek lore, we understand what the setting is in Star Trek history during this time. It's a very dark time in quote unquote the Star Trek universe. But not everyone knows that. So you have to establish that first. Yeah. So I felt like what they did strategically, it did help. It neatly gave us some pretty interesting moments with our characters, like when Agnes was fumbling around within 
the mind the of the mind Borg of, Queen. Oh my god, dude. And through that scene, we learn about some of her fears and insecurities, yep. as well as how she views Picard's emotional detachment, which was very telling. So that wasn't that's that's what we didn't have last season. There was strategy and cleverness behind how they're going to dispense information on our characters and the fact that we learned so much about agnes through a i want to say a three or four minute scene but at the same time as us learning about agnes in a way that normally she would never do because people are not vulnerable in that way or they do not allow themselves to be vulnerable in that way and just disclose all of this private information about themselves so we take a moment we get into the borg's mind we learn about her and the areas that the Borg Queen is trying to infiltrate. Then through that process, we learn about Picard. So we learn about Agnes. We learned about how, and we're going to talk about this a lot more later in the show. We learned how the Borg go about assimilating things. And that may seem kind of old. Like, well, we've always learned that. Well, yeah, we've learned from the technical side, like how the technology works and how yes. it assimilates but this was more metaphysical. Yes. And I thought that was really interesting. And through that metaphysical aspect, we learned also some things about Picard, some mm -hmm. very telling moments. And I'm paraphrasing here what Agnes said. Tell me about feelings and the last time you had them. You pretend to have feelings to avoid having feelings. So how awful must it be to feel what you and then she stops? Yes. So that scene, along with Q's statement about the kind of life you understand, or the only kind, kind of, of life, life you, you understand, understand. Yeah. what else was lost in the wake of your fear, suddenly we start to get a, a more clearer picture of what this season is really about. Yeah, and it, this isn't... The one criticism I've uh, I've seen people, people have doubled down and basically said, oh, here we go again, we're going to bash... Picard. We're no, going to yeah. say he's a he's a worthless human being. No, we're touching on a subject that, w as Star Trek fans, you sh we should all know this. Mm -hmm. The one overlying theme of character narrative that Picard has had since day one is the fact that he is never close with anybody. He's never close with anybody. That's the whole point about like the end of TNG when he sits down with the crew and says, "You know what? I probably should have done this more." Yeah. It, that's the whole point. It He's, is. That's who he is. Yeah, but we've never quite fully understood why he was like that. We had always assumed that, sure, he's uncomfortable with fraternizing with his crew. I feel like that's how we viewed it as TNG fans. Yeah, because like we as TNG fans, I know a lot of people in the very beginning, you know, we've, we've talked about Picard's history and everyone always says, well, he has all these relationships. Yes, he has these relationships, but they're he, he's not very close with them. We have we all... as fans want to believe that Picard has always been close, but in actuality, if you look at the very beginnings, Picard's not a very close person. He's a very guarded person. He doesn't want to let people in. You nope. literally have to force force your way in the only person he's ever really showed emotions to outside of his vulnerable circle. Is data. data. If you look at uh, first contact and how he called him a friend and he wanted to go back and save his friend's life. And then, of course, the sacrifice and nemesis and how it affected Picard emotionally. It was obvious he cared for this guy yeah. for, for data. And same thing with the first season. It was one of the good things they did last season with the, the the season finale and how Data and Picard had their moment. They were able to communicate with each other. But even at that moment, he still didn't quite say he loved Data. He, he said Data. he guess I want to say he said, I suppose in a way I do love him or love you. I forgot how it was stated. But if you, do you remember that moment? Yeah. He didn't outwardly say. He didn't I, say I love you. Yeah, and same thing with Data. So and, and obviously that would feel weird and and unnecessary and it'd feel out of character if Picard was Oh, to, absolutely. And same thing with Data. It would feel out of character it'd for both those character. characters to profess their love. But even in an episode like that, you you get the sense that Picard is uncomfortable with the intimacy. 
so this has always been a part of the character. It doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily mean it's a bad thing that they're trying to say about him. It's not an indictment of Picard like it was last season. This is just a part of his character. And obviously it's going to play and is playing a big part in the overall season. Oh, yeah, because absolutely. Because those moments, it, it brings greater context, the things we were talking about. It brings greater context to the season and what might just be in play. Perhaps this has to do with Picard's inability to actually live a life of emotional value due yes. to his fears. Uh, that obviously has something to do with his inability to be emotionally vulnerable. Well, think about it, too. I mean, like, we're, we're, we're starting to dive deep into the the. Narr- character characteristics of the character Jean-Luc Picard and if you think about it in all of his history TNG movies take all the moments the moments when Picard's most emotional is when he is broken like say for example when he mind melds with Sarek he breaks because he feels so much emotion, emotional weight from Sarek it breaks him and then you have that emotional moment and he shows emotion for the first time when he is interrogated, the four light scene. Why is that such a powerful scene? Because Picard's so, so stoic and so emotionally guarded. That's, that- that's what, that's the word to use. Cause he does. I don't want people thinking, Oh, he's like, a. they're thinking he's like a Vulcan. It doesn't show no. emotion. He has emotion and he yeah. shows emotion. He's not willing to be vulnerable. That's yeah. the difference. He's emotionally guarded. Yeah. And, in a, in a lot of ways, being emotionally guarded can be a can be an asset. It can be an advantage, but it also the one thing that it's never really touched on until like the very end of TNG, and sometimes in the movies, it can also be a detriment because being that emotionally guarded means you you keep everyone else out. You don't have emotional ties. That's why, you know, he he stayed away from Riker and Troy and all the rest of his crew. That's why, you know, you don't see him with someone like the character, uh, like fans out there think that he should be with uh, Dr. Crusher by this time. No, he's emotionally guarded. He doesn't, he's not that type of person. Yeah. So, so all of this, it's very much on par with what we know of Picard. So that's why this entire element with Agnes and the Borg and Q's little words before he disappeared and vanished, I should say. Um, that's why this whole thing feels very sincere to the character. It feels like the writers, as I said last episode, has a far greater understanding of the character. And Picard, David, is doing stuff. When he asked Chris Rios to give him control of navigation, I was like, thank you. Thank you. (laughs) Thank you for not having Picard act like a bumbling idiot who has no idea what to do on board or even like even take the moment of emotion when you know spoiler a certain character dies and how is that a spoiler dave <laughs> we both know and i'm sure we both know <laughs> and if, if if our audience is listening to us well i like to think that our audience listens to us first and then goes yeah, watches the don't episode. do that listeners that's awful but, <laughs> like the the one moment in the episode that truly showed that emotional distance that picard has mm-hmm is the death of Elnor. Here's a character that basically, remember, since first season, it's established the relationship between Elnor and Picard is very close. It's a mentor and a student. And there's Picard having to make the tough decision, what do I do? Do I let my student die, or do I let the one you know, asset of ours, do we lose that? He made the right decision. And he, ma- yeah. and he made the right decision command decision right he read the ethical and moral decision you know the emotional decision he didn't make the right decision he made the right command decision yeah but based on what david now we're getting to areas of moral value statements. exactly like, who- and that's something that picard's not not strong in he's never been that strong in being emotional making those emotional no calls. But, but one thing about picard that we both have always liked is his objectivity exactly. and his ability to govern through policy and philosophy Mm -hmm. i mean there have been i mean do you remember the episode where data was trying to save a girl and her family from the demise oh my god dude yeah and picard's like no no yeah like no the 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 prime directive 
specifically states that this is interference. So there have been moments where people have gone, you know, in years past, or I mean, I'm say, I want to say years later, I should say after these episodes and they go back and watch them. There's people who have done, you know, blog posts and they're not like essays or anything highly intellectual, but there's little blog posts and thoughts about the episode and what Picard did. And they're legitimately upset with the character and they mm-hmm. say that he's unlikable. Yeah. And I'm like, that isn't being unlikable. That's literally what Star Trek was built on. The idea of the prime directive and not doing certain things solely based on emotion. Most based on emotion. Yeah. I mean, look at that guiding principle that we always go to. And it's such a big part of Star Trek. The needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And mm-hmm. if you look at what happened in this episode with Elnor, the needs of the many Outweigh. Definitely outweighed the needs of the one. And and the thing I love about it, too, was the fact that I think that Patrick Stewart's hitting his groove now because he's being able to emote emotion. And you could see when he is actually in that scene, he's emotionally conflicted. But Picard, he's staying true to that character. Picard is that stoic. No, we're going to make this decision. It'll be fine. We'll, we'll work it out in the end. And, you know, like constantly basically trying to be that tree, that very, that, that grounded anchor for everybody. Yeah. And yet at that moment, it just, I don't know. It's like this look that, that Patrick Stewart can give that shows he is emotionally inside crying, weeping because like he's watching, he's watching essentially like a sun figure die in front of him. <laughs> yeah. And, and, that's why I said Picard's not being seen being shown to be weak at all this season. He's being shown to be who he truly is. I he- think this is, as I said, David, that this is the Picard we're we're accustomed to. We're accustomed to. Yeah, now. this is this is the Picard. This is the real the real Picard stood up, Dave. Can the because that's what we said last season. Can the real Picard please stand up? Where yes. is he? And here he is in season two. And here he is in season two. And especially in this episode, because while everyone is bashing him and everything, like, especially that scene, that scene with Raffi, where Raffi's angry at Picard for the decision he makes. Normally, if this was season one, people would be all over that saying that, you know, screw Raffi. But you really do understand both sides here. Raffi is emotional at this point because she just watched Elnor die. So, of course, she's going to be angry. She's going to be angry and she's going to be upset. But also Picard plays that duality, the, the other side basically saying he has to be the uh, the one to make the difficult decision yeah. to save everyone because it's not about, just like what you said, the needs of the one outweighing the needs of the many. Right. So outside of conjecture and speculating what these characters are or are not doing, what does it do in the way of of writing? What does it do for the characters? And although, as you mentioned, the Raffi stuff, it, you know, it definitely borderlined on insubordination. And I felt like we were possibly going to go into those areas of last season, last season that yeah. bothered me. But this part or this didn't bother me no. for a very specific reason, because it wasn't a it wasn't just some miscellaneous disrespect for some convoluted message that no one understood that was the indictment of Picard last season. Yes. This was purposeful. It shined a light on Q's dealings and perhaps, perhaps they're posing the question, we shouldn't just accept Q as a harmless trickster. Now, I'm not against putting Q on trial, so to speak, but turning him into a villain, you've got to be careful. Got to be careful. Now, the idea of turning someone like Q into a villain doesn't mean he suddenly changes his character let's say the writers suddenly turn him maniacal but however what they can do if you want to turn a character like this into the villain or a villain rather than simply an obstacle for Picard or a teaching tool or a philosophical tool when you look at it from a writing standpoint you could use Q or I should say the way they it's all about let me it's all about perspective Dave perspective. I'm, I'm getting off topic here I'm trying to go in different directions let me stay focused <laughs> It's all about perspective and how it's executed. You can keep Q in the exact same way he's always been, 
but we now alter the perspective. And one way of doing that is posing the question via Rafi's complaint about Q and the alleged games that Picard and Q play with yes. other people's lives. That is a way of changing the perspective on Q from simply being a trickster to possibly someone who has some repercussions coming his way. Perhaps there is something he has done. Maybe this is about him as well. Maybe this is about putting Q on trial as well. Well, not only that, I mean, ever since the last episode, the one thing that I, I'm like more and more getting attached to is the idea that Q is at his end of the road. Q is dying. And like now everything is coming back to haunt him. And it makes more sense too in regards to like that that scene with Rafi. You take that in parallel with the scene in episode two where Picard is furious at Q and telling him, I'm tired of these games. And if you notice, what does Q do whenever he brings up this being a game? Yeah, time's cruel, time's this. You know, this is not a game. You're but the you're but you're not a piece, you're but the board I play on. Mm-hmm. And it it really does. He didn't say I play on, or but the game. the game is played on. Yeah, and like the 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 one thing I'm like really interested to see, and I hope that they go with, is the fact that just like you said, it's a different perspective now. Q is not going to be a trickster, especially if he's at it, at the end of the road for him. For yeah, himself. exactly. So if they're going the route of possibly like maybe a little bit of an introspection, you know, a way to dissect Q's dealings and maybe even have some retribution for everything that he has done, done. M- maybe they could find a way. Since the story of Q and Picard have always been so closely placed together, it would be actually pretty clever and appropriate for them to tell a similar story of the two, you know, through Q's desire to teach Picard a lesson for whatever reason. Yeah. At the same time, there's now a lesson for Q. There's a lesson for Q. As well, which would be an interesting way to bring his story to an end. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's talk about Seven of Nine. This is a character in Star Trek Voyager that was very complicated and by the end of the show's seventh season ended up being a truly fascinating character study. Yes. Uh, Probably one of my, probably on my, I would say she's probably on my top five favorite Star Trek characters of all time because of what they did with her. I mean, it was a deep dive into the human condition to say the least. That's why I was so perturbed with last season's inclusion of the character don't just bring a character in because you think it will help sell tickets if you bring a character in play like this like seven of nine then you need to use them as the way they were constructed and you must flesh them out further in a way that does not disrupt the continuity of the character but feels authentic to the continuation of this individual's journey and david three episodes in And we already are getting things that feel more true to the character. For example, her insecurities. That was a big part in Star Trek Voyager. Where was her insecurities last season, Dave? (laughs) She was so overly confident and angry that we never saw any of those insecurities. I think I think you hit it on the head with her characterization of she's Sarah Connor. She was Sarah Connor. She was (laughs) not seven of nine. She was not seven of nine. So here we have examples of her insecurities being formerly Borg and essentially permanently marked or scarred by the devastating violation of Borg assimilation. It's an element that was a big part of Seven's story in Voyager. And to see them actually continue that part of her story makes perfect sense. Well, the amazing thing, too, is they're they're diving into it because at this point, she doesn't have the Borg implants. Exactly. But she still has the memory of the Borg implants. Right. And now she's able to see the other side. Yes. The other side of it. And at first, I was not on board the idea of removing her Borg qualities. But now that I see 
they are using it to play within the psychological Mm -hmm. and bring to the forefront the insecurities she lives with every day, knowing that most people are unable to see past her Borg implants and the deep prejudices she's endured. This so far appears to be more on par with Seven as a character. It's more authentic to her and aligns with what we know of her story from Star Trek Voyager. Yeah. Because you know why, David? Because the writers this season actually know the character. Yeah. Last not- season, it, I don't I I I don't know what they thought they were doing with 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 everything. Everything that crossed the board was a mess. But one of but the way they dealt with her character as well was just one of those things that I kept going back to. It just bothered me. Well, because, because it, it just it was not seven of nine. Yeah, it wasn't seven of nine, and we all understand the one who shall be na- not named, Michael Shaban. <laughs> I like you to say uh, the one who shall not be named, and then you name him, and then I name him. But I just want to make sure that's clear. Um, the one we wish we never knew <laughs> the name of, <laughs> but did not know about that character. Does not understand that character's he either, trauma. He either didn't know or he just didn't give a shit. Yeah, and like here, you really do get the sense that they do understand, and the fact that they're making it, they're making it part of her story. That basically the trauma is still there, even without the Borg implants. Seven still has like the phantom of uh, the phantom feelings that the, the implants are still there, but yeah. they're not. Yeah. Why? Because trauma does not go away. Yes. And I love that story. Yeah. If they, if they tap into that, it's so easy to, to tie her story in with what Picard's going through about how nothing is forgotten. You don't have, you know, just because you wipe everything away doesn't mean that all your problems are gone. Yeah. It's not a it's not a healthy way of dealing with your quote unquote emotions. Right. So it it's a really I'm really digging. I hate to say it, man. I'm really I'm fully on board with Picard season two. And I'm a little I'm nervous. A, I'm nervous I'm now. A, I'm nervous because of it. Because, because I'm like going, I don't want them to drop the ball. When when is the train going to slam it's, into the wall? Please don't. Please. <laughs> But just continuing continuing with Seven of Nine for a few moments more here, Dave, just to stress the the difference between last season and this season, to contrast the difference. Last season, David, her story arc was propelled by an odd type of vengeance that never actually paid off, nor did we fully explore. Yeah. The aftermath of her actions, the aftermath of her actions... The murder of her ex-lover, it did absolutely nothing. Nothing. Like, at that moment when we were watching the episode, I remember thinking, oh, wow, she just murdered this person in cold blood. Mm -hmm. Let's see how this pays off. And was there a payoff, Mike? No. No. She just murdered someone. There was no payoff. Mm -hmm. There was just nothing. It's weird. And that's why vengeance is not always a great story motivator. Many times, vengeance can be very weak. It's, sure, it progresses the plot, but without fully exploring the nuances of vengeance and what it does to the person, there's just no story there. No story. And listen, I'm a fan of the classic vengeance tales, especially from the 70s, the exploitation films. I mean, what, especially Westerns. I mean, the spaghetti Westerns. How many of those things were fueled by vengeance? Oh, yeah. But typically, there's something to the vengeance. The vengeance is just the superficial. Then you deal with what the vengeance will do to someone if they go through the with it. The consequences of that vengeance. Yeah, or perhaps they wrestle with the notion of vengeance and they end up not actually following through with that. Mm-hmm. We never really had that with Seven of Nine. No. There was no payoff at all across the board when it came to her story. Mm-hmm. Um, even, like, okay, so, for example, vengeance. I don't want people throwing things at the at their phones or throwing their phones across the room because sure vengeance has always played a part in star trek in some yes. way star trek first contact absolutely when you had vicard and his obsession with getting rid of the borg and annihilating them i mean it was very much a tribute or an homage to moby dick moby dick vengeance so it works, but it wasn't just the superficial notions of vengeance. Look what Picard had to deal with when he allowed himself to succumb. 
that was the consequences, yes. how he alienated himself from his crew. That's that's the reason why when you compare this season to next season, the way they've handled the, the character last, or last season. Last season yeah. Sorry, the next season. Are you going into the future? Did you just <laughs> go around the sun? I just went around the sun. But like when you compare the two seasons, the difference of how they handled the characters is like night and day. Dude, because it, it, it really is. Because like you have seven now. We understand her motivations, her 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 trauma, her psychology. It's all tied to her alienation of being Borg. Yeah. And it makes sense. And that's why, you know, like, I know when you look at season one, you could have seen that. You could have seen that. But then you look at other characters, like, say, Raffi. Mm -hmm. In the very beginning of the season, they I, you could see what they were trying to show. A character that basically is down on their luck and blames people you know of higher rank and you know er, it's all everyone else's fault mm -hmm. but doesn't want but in the end they have to take responsibility for their actions right here her motivations is perfect the whole reason why she is the way she is especially in this episode is because since the beginning she has that relationship with Eleanor where she's trying to be the a, a mentor she's taken this kid under her wing almost like a child and treats him You're like talking about son. Raffi. Yeah, Raffi. Yeah. And now it's more palatable when she's angry at J uh, at mm -hmm. uh, I was about to say JL, Jesus. <laughs> it was about uh, when she's angry at Picard, it's more palatable because mm -hmm. we understand why she's angry. It's proper motivation. It's proper that motivation. We can yeah. It's a mother grieving because hey, the per the the son that she adopted just got you know Cat right, uh, right, right in front of her. Yeah. So it's all it's all about how it's executed. It's all about execution. Yeah. Because even in like Star Trek three with the idea of vengeance, there was consequences when Picard became obsessed obsessed with the death of his son. And understandably. And that idea of consequence and his act of vengeance, the act of vengeance. was something that was a part of his story until the very end, until Star Trek Six. Yeah, dude, let them die. Yeah, it's so, still the most. It's, it's it's a scene that me and you have talked in an Ozium, but it's one of those most one of the most powerful scenes in Star Trek because you have Kirk, literally looking at his best friend and saying, "No, I want this entire species to die." Yeah, he, <laughs> at that moment, he was the embodiment of pure prejudice. Pure prejudice. And that's why it was amaz amazing. And it was all connected to Star Trek Three and his act of vengeance, which played a part in Star Trek Four, Star Trek Five, and Star Trek Six. So vengeance can't work if it's not just used as simply the superficial mm -hmm. and as a lazy plot device to just simply move your plot forward. So the Borg assimilation, Dave, let's talk about that. That was such a trippy scene. I loved it. And how it was explained in a more metaphysical yeah. type of way as opposed to the techno technological explanations, which we've understood for decades at this point. So we understand how assimilation works. Yeah. But we've never quite had the opportunity to hear it explained in this type of way. And to see them frame it in the, in the concept or in a concept that was very much like a, a down the rabbit hole vibe, yes. you know, and then they made it tangible by giving it this concept of the metaphysical and car compartmentalized different areas of the brain, having Agnes narrate what's happening and to see how they infiltrate, how they actually fight against your subconscious mm -hmm. and they end up consuming everything. It's yes. a no win or a no. Yeah. It's a no win situation, which I like because it shows just how diabolical the Borg, the Borg are, are because it's not simply a, a virus that is exacerbated by little nano Bots. What are yeah. they? I always forget what they are. Techn Not, uh, technovirus. I, I essentially. Forgot. What is it called? The Borg thing? The nano. Nanites? Nanites. There we go. It's not just simply technology, but now you're looking at. Now, of course, the idea, the violation, the violation of the yeah. body that's horrific and taking over someone's mind. But now we see the slow process 
and the truly torturous experience that the people being assimilated go through losing their mind little by little it's not instant no it's slow and that's why i like about it tying with picard too is like Mm -hmm. it really forms it forms around the idea that they should have done in season one which is explain why seven and picard are so traumatized by the borg Mm -hmm. instead of just telling us oh they're traumatized no Show us what, what, why are they? Why are they traumatized by this? And in that one scene, dude, I love the fact that basically they literally said it would be dangerous for Picard. And I'm paraphrasing. It'd be dangerous for Picard to go into the mind of the board queen yeah. because she'll see she him already, coming. She already knows his mind. She already knows his mind. Yeah. That's why you, they, you send Agnes who she does not know at all. Oh, so David, let's give a round of applause to the writers of Picard for Akiva Goldsman for giving us. Okay, because this is a complaint I've had about the Borg. Even though I loved Voyager, the Voyager kind of overused the Borg in a way that worked for their story, but by the end, they were no longer a threat. They weren't yeah. scary. The the zombie horror vibe of the Borg That's was no longer there. It wasn't nerve. It wasn't scary anymore. If you remember mm-hmm. the first time we were on the Borg cube in TNG, it was terrifying. It was suspenseful. The music, the cinematography, everything was geared to create the horrific, the vibe of of the unknown, the dread, and that had kind of gone away after First Contact and then Voyager. But here we have the writers actually making the Borg scary again. Yes. Having the queen up high, suspended, just lurching over them. As a viewer, I'm waiting for her eyes to pop open and turn at them when they're not expecting it. Oh, I'm expecting that. I'm expecting she is like <laughs> she's like the ultimate threat, dude. Yeah. I'm the, sorry. The see, Borg queen, a tiger does not change its stripes. They managed to make the Borg scary again yeah and that's something i didn't think they would ever be able to do that's what i'm trying to figure out that one thing that has me on pins and needles is we know that the borg the borg queen herself Mm -hmm. goes to find it goes to look for picard for help that's her how do we get from this scary monster to suddenly look up uh, look up picard look up jean Luc? yeah and i'm like going that's going to be the most interesting journey because at this point we've always known the Borg to be scary, but in this episode they just turned it well, turned back the clock y- on them. Yes, yeah, scary at, to the characters they because the threat of losing themselves and being assimilated. But I'm talking about as the audience, as we the didn't audience. really feel that dread anymore yeah. and that fear. Now they were able to capture that aura again. Yes. Because, like, there's nothing more traumatizing than someone taking over your mind. Body horror, man. Body yeah. horror is the worst. For, I hate body horror. Well, especially it's, since she's missing her limbs and she's yeah. just towering over them. And I'm like going, listen, this is really messed up visuals. But, but them titties, though, still. I mean, <laughs> what's her name? Annie Worshing. Any washing, yeah. Oh, in real life, she is a goddess. Oh, she's 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 very good looking. She but, might give Jerry Ryan a run but, for her money. But Mike. After this episode, would you want to touch the board queen? Listen, I don't. No, I'm, I'm writing. No, no, no. I'm writing slash fiction right now as we speak. <laughs> you want to assimilate me? Assimilate <laughs> this. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so stupid. <laughs> it was so stupid, but so funny. So, David, overall, the writing is a thousand times better. It is, and we are early. And I'm very it, nervous. We are very early in the season. It's too early to say that we are in the clear. Far too early. But just through the analysis of the first three episodes, there's an obvious direction the show is taking. There's intent, motivation, and a yes. greater understanding of the Trek universe that was not there last season. And that is the reason why I have hope for the remaining seven episodes yes because of everything they're giving to us so far in three episodes i feel like it's enough to gauge the quality of the rest of the season again it's too early to say for sure but i do feel confident dave i absolutely do 
Now, one thing a lot of people messaged us about last season was about Picard season one, not just being a poor iteration of Trek, but a poorly developed science fiction series. Yes. So it wasn't just the idea that it didn't feel like Star Trek, which is what a lot of people said about Discovery's first season. And a lot of people admitted it's a great, sh- it's written fine, which we had our problems with the writing. But for the most part, people said it's written fine if it was just a science fiction show. No, it isn't. But this is Star Trek. <laughs> yes. And it didn't really feel like Star Trek. Mm-hmm. Well, that's what I felt about Picard season one. But I also felt like it was a terrible science fiction show, which is what a lot of our our listeners tweeted us as well and sent us messages saying the exact same thing. You guys are spot on. The writing wasn't just a bad Star Trek. It was just a badly written it's science sci-fi. fiction show. Yeah. So we don't have those issues. The writing across the board is also strong. So even taking away the Star Trek elements and just looking at the writing of a science fiction show, that also is standing above last season. Yeah. All right. So the time travel element, I will say, (laughs) we can all be at ease, was awesome. It was. Although, just on a side note... I really wanted them to actually do the whole, you know, going around the sun, everything goes weird, and you see like the baby, the the baby, and the the fate, their faces in the white, in the white. Yeah, it's weird. <laughs> but okay, they didn't go that route. Yes, but, they did. But I did like that they did give us a little bit of the same experience that the Star Trek Four crew, yes, went through when they did the whole reversal of time. You had the the transitions, the the white flashes the into white the flashes. slow motion effects. Yes. I was like, this is straight from Star Trek Four. And because they were giving us those moments, I was expecting for the baby to show up the and baby. the faces melting into like what, what was it like milk? It was like Almost milk like a, or clouds. It was like a white molding substance. I want to say that was liquefied. Yeah. I, and I, I believe it, that's what it was. That's what I was waiting I for because it, they were trying uh, back then they were trying to go really psychedelic with it and, you know, do the 2001, a space odyssey type of thing. Mm-hmm. But, it, <laughs> but in hindsight, it's probably the worst thing to do, but yeah, here they treated it properly. They still gave you the same effect. Yes. And they remove some of the more dated, dated effects. aspects. Yeah. yeah. So it worked for me. But even the the areas of scientific theory that they use to express the potential outcome or idea, like when Rafi asked about Eleanor's death, even things like that are being done a lot. I want to say better. I would, um, they're yeah. being executed a little bit more strategically coherent and coherently there we go coherently david they're not just throwing out random things that don't make sense yeah the fact that they had agnes mention the possibility of existing outside a temporal causality loop that allows for them to have some wiggle room that's why shaban you don't try to figure out your show after five episodes yeah and because that's because how- you give yourself some wiggle room because if they wanted to now Let's say by episode eight or nine, as they're writing, they realize, well, there's some things that we want to change a little bit. Let's make sure the time aspects that they're messing with isn't going to affect A, B, and C. Well, now they can justify in a way that's not going to make us roll our eyes because they briefly introduce a potential way out. Yes. And also, I thought that was genius because... Already, you have to, especially with a character like Raffi, you have to re-engage those characters. And I thought that that was a brilliant way of re-motivating that character. Because that character is coming off of just losing, the emotions, losing yeah. emotions, right? But now she's basically being told, if if this works, Elnor will come back because he's, you know, outside that po- bubble. Possibly. Possibly. And it's that possibility that, gives her that motivation and suddenly Raffi now has new character motivation. She's going to do this because she, she knows that there's a possibility that she can save Elnor. Right. There you go. And that's, and that's what I mean. It was like in three episodes, the writing is more coherent and it's, more spot on it's strategic where it's strategic. And that's, yeah. that's something that a lot of shows don't do. So it's not just Shea Ban and Picard Throwing season darts one. at the wall. It's <laughs> exactly darts. I, I call them wet spit 
spit wads, you spit know, balls. in high school, yeah. those kids that used to like get the paper towels wet and throw them at the ceiling and maybe one will stick. <laughs> Jesus, that's depressing. Dude. <laughs> <laughs> With this season, and I want to say accomplished, talented showrunners, they utilize something called narrative plants. And narrative plants are used when you want, when you basically want to bookmark something because you may go back to it later. For example, let's say you have a TV show and you want people to understand why the character at the end of the episode murdered his father. Yeah. And he used an axe to do it. Now, by the end of the episode, if you just have him wield an axe and he lives in suburbia, you might wonder, well, where did he get an axe from? Well, if you want to create suspense and justify certain things, you would show us a scene either two episodes prior or at least at the beginning of that episode where there is an axe involved. Let's yes. say he's cutting down a tree. Now, suddenly, certain things make sense. Now, that is a very simple explanation, but I think people can get the the gist of the analogy. Yeah. And that's what they did with the causality loop. It's a narrative plant that will allow them to go back to it later if they choose to. And if they don't, something like that really doesn't matter. It's not considered a, a loose narrative thread. Yes. So we'll see what they do with it. So if people aren't aware of what a causal loop is, a causal loop is a theoretical proposition in which by means of either retro causality or time travel, a sequence of events, actions, information, objects, people is among the causes of another event, yes. which is in turn among the causes of the first mentioned, mentioned event. event. There's a lot of interesting things you guys can read about that if you want to look it up online. Oh, yeah. It'll give you a headache if you try to actually. It's actually a fun read, though. It's a, it's a fun read. But if man, you can pin down the theories. Yes. Like even that brief synapses there gave me a bit of a, a headache. Yeah. Because like it's you have to wrap your mind around things like quantum physics, mm -hmm. where basically everything is possible because. It's possible. I remember like someone, one of my teachers telling me that and it made my brain hurt because, <laughs> because essentially that type of science, there's truth behind it, yeah. but it's so hard to find that truth without that initial, that initial science happening. If people want to watch a movie that you, that literally uses the causality, causality loop, the gone and as well as the Godfather paradox in a movie, and it, they do it successfully. Yes, it's called Predestination. Yes, with Ethan Hawke. With Ethan Hawke, that movie will blow your fucking mind. It'll 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 make your head hurt. And yet they do it in a way that's easy for audiences to understand. So and if you want a little bit on that, that's a movie I recommend. Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about the politics, David. All right, here and we go. All, <laughs> I had no problem with anything that was included for various reasons. Because you're a rational human being, Mike. Yes, yes, I know. <laughs> and I saw a lot of people complaining about some of the politics, the immigration stuff, <sighs> uh, the comment that Rafi made about, what was it? I have it written down. Hold on. Let me get the exact thing she wrote or said. Let's see here. Maybe I don't have it written down. I'm trying to find. Was it? The, are you talking about like the. Uh... Oh, okay. Here it is. When she said, I have never been able to understand how a society with so many contradictions yeah. had not collapsed sooner than it did. Yes. She is fucking spot on. She's spot on. That is the most. If you had to pinpoint a singular problem, which is very hard to do. Yes. When it comes to. The problems within our current society. Take it even further. In this country specifically. That is the most simplest way to pinpoint the exact problem. Yes. I felt like it was a genius statement. And then we moved on. But then she said comments about pollution and the yes. way 
people are acting. Then it's basically you start seeing them uh, like stepping on the 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 soapbox. Right. They stepped on the soapbox. However, however, Dave, because I do agree with that. And at first, I was like, okay, you're just kind of gonna you're gonna agitate people knowing that you're speaking about current times. Yes. But she's right, and also. I'm going to explain that by saying, by besides just saying she's right, the politics actually parallels the new reality that Picard and his team find themselves in. And this world they find themselves in, it parallels seamlessly with the realities that many of us face in today in our world. Yeah. The idea of totalitarianism, you know, and or total totalitarianism. There you Jesus go. Christ. <laughs> um, tongue. It's not a tongue twister. I just can't speak sometimes. Those ideas of the tyrannical ha- had all become very more, very more. I'm losing my train of thought. <laughs> all of these things have become a little bit more of a reality after the January 6th Capitol riots. Yeah. And I don't want to get overly political. Yes, <laughs> I'm I'm typically middle of the road when it comes to the po- when it comes to politics. I'm an, I'm an independent. Yeah. However, no one can look at January 6th, shrug and say, yeah, that represents no problem in this country. Yeah, hey, everything's good. Even if you agreed with the riot, why did they riot? Trace your line of reasoning because a group of people were so passionate and believed something so fully. That they needed to correct the error by infiltrating the Capitol. So even if you don't believe the right itself was wrong, you obviously believe that there's something wrong with this country. So much so that you condone the January 6th attack. Now, from the other side, the people who view this as an attack on democracy and very closely the actual collapse of democracy in this country... Because let's say they won. They had ropes. They had weapons. They were willing to do some shit. Yes. It would have changed the very way we all wake up every morning as American citizens. Easily. Easily. And so, that's, what's, that's what's so traumatic about it. So when they say something like the contradictions in a society or they say it's no wonder that the time incursion happened at this time because it resembles so closely their new reality. Their new reality, yep. They're drawing parallels to the turmoils of today, which are present. No one can deny that. So why get upset with the political statement? From either side, it's fucking fact. Well, yeah. And and also, it's kind of like they touch on things that I think not a lot of Star Trek fans understand too that have already been established the time frame that they've jumped to is the same time frame we saw in deep space nine when they jumped into the past and when they jumped into the past they jumped into a san francisco that was the 1960s with, right no it wasn't the 1960s what are you it talking about when they jumped into you not about star trek four no 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 Oh, deep, uh, deep Space Nine. Oh, I know what you're in. talking about. Yeah. Deep, yeah. Okay. When they jumped yeah. into the two parter, the two parter, yeah. and you found out, like, in our history, homelessness was just rampant. Yep. That's where they, that's where they jumped to. So it made sense. Listen, people are homeless. Yeah. They have no homes. We, no one can disagree that the United States is at a crossroads. Is at a crossroads. And for them to pick 2024, at first, when it was announced, six, seven months ago that they're going to be going back in time to 2024. I kind of groaned, but now that I see what they're doing, they're literally using this as a way, at least in this episode, I don't think the entire season is taking place in the year 2024. That would get very old, very fast, but they're picking 2024 as a way to flesh out political thought, thereby strengthening the narrative of the show and making Star Trek relevant once again from a political context. Yes. Because Star Trek has always done these types of things. And I want to go past Star Trek because that's something that a lot of people say when they're justifying Star Trek. Oh, it's always been a part of Star Trek. 
But let's take it further, David. Politics has always been a part of science fiction. In fact, oh, I would easily. argue and say it isn't science fiction if you're not saying something political. Mm-hmm. Science fiction displaces our concerns as a people, as a society, into a very high, hyper-fictionalized setting so we can find a way to deal with it. Yes. That's the power of true science fiction. Throw any science fiction show at me, and I will point to the political message. Oh, yeah. It's always there. And if it's not there, then it isn't a good piece of science fiction. Oh, yeah. You can throw, uh, outside of Star Trek, you can throw in Blade Runner. The Expanse. Battlestar Expanse? Galactica. Battlestar Galactica. Babylon 5. Dune. Uh, yes. <laughs> it, that's why, you know, getting off topic here, but staying on topic, Star Wars isn't science fiction. It's fantasy. Yeah, I tried not to actually mention them because, you if know. People get mad about it. They but, get mad about it. But guess it. what? It isn't science fiction. <laughs> it is 100% fantasy. Yeah. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's fantasy. That's all. The moment you explain your world through the guise of magic which is what the force is. <laughs> it's it's fantasy. It's fantasy. And also there's no political message for the most part in Star Wars because it's fantasy. Fantasy doesn't typically explore the nuances of political debate whereas yes. science fiction does. So if you're still complaining about Star Trek dealing with politics, you fucking have to reevaluate the genre you like. Maybe yeah. you don't like science fiction. You like science fantasy. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm not trying to get salty with the listeners out there, but I I am getting tired of the complaints about some of these things that are, they're just not valid complaints. Maybe subjectively people might be burnt out with politics, but just because you're burnt out doesn't mean Star Trek is going to refrain from doing the very things that they've always done. They've always done. And my complaint when they do politics is whether it's strong or weak. Yeah, that's where I'm going to complain. If you're just throwing out statements and there's no like motivation behind it and there's no actual bigger message and story that helps keep it consistent, then you're just throwing out things and you want to be on a soapbox. Yes. But so far, everything is flowing into the next. And I say that about Star Trek Discovery season four, as well as the current season of Star Trek Picard. Yeah. Uh, One listener wrote. This is a low bar to aim for when it comes to Star Trek Picard. The tone this season is more or less like Star Trek proper, but that also has a lot to do with the fact that not only is the show carried by two actual Star Trek characters that have been properly developed in other shows, but every plot and arc introduced is lifted, sometimes verbatim, (laughs) from earlier Star Trek shows or movies. Oh, are we going here? And they continue. I think that with some clever editing, you could recreate the show from snippets from the earlier shows and movies beat for beat. I think it, I think they want to come out and just say that this is Star Trek 4. And then they say the ending will, of course, be an underwhelming disappointment as per usual with New Trek. So with that last word, New Trek, in you... T-R-E-K, which I think is the most unclever insult in all of fandoms. It kind of, it's kind of wearing In all it's, fandoms. It's wearing it out its welcome it's, with me. It's just not clever. It's not. Like, be more clever with it, at least. If you're going to insult something, be smart with your insult so someone can't say you're dumb. And here's I the thing. I hate that word, New Trek. Even though I agree with some of the people who are disillusioned with New Trek Overall, it is not it is not worth your scorn. No, especially when you read newspaper clippings of things that people said about T and G when T and G launched. The same thing was said about Deep Space Nine. Yeah. The same thing was said about Voyager. The same thing was said about Enterprise. With every new iteration of Star Trek, somebody pointed and say this isn't Star Trek. It's not good. It's an abomination. And that's why when people say new Trek and they use that as their way to give a critical critique, I should say, not a critical critique, a critique of an episode and they end it with new Trek, they lose all credibility with me. Yeah, they do. I, especially me because it's kind of like I'm getting to that point when people say, well, they did this already in Star Trek. I'm like, yes. And your point is, and I, listen, are they doing it 
are they doing it okay? Or did you not like that iteration of Star Trek in the past? Is that what you're saying? <laughs> now, I do. A, I understand where he's coming from with that opening paragraph about lifting certain things. We've made jokes about it as well. Oh, yeah. But I feel like it has everything to do with the overall story, what it says about Picard, and how it all ends. Yeah, I think that's, that's what they're missing is, like, it's not about ripping off from other iterations of Star Trek. What is the true narrative of the story? This true narrative of this season so far is a story about Picard dealing with the later years of his life. See, to me, that statement partially fits season one a bit better in the way of a descriptor because because you could say that the show's strength was Picard and Seven of Nine two characters that they really didn't flesh out last season and they just simply used as ways to scurry up favor with fans that have been on the fence and bring the power of nostalgia into the mix so that they can create a highly publicized Star Trek series because you have Patrick Stewart coming back. Buzz, there you go. But this season is very different. And that's why even though there are similar similarities, as long as you're bringing something new with that, then you're fine. Yeah. And so far, as I said at the top of the show, they're fleshing out the idea of Borg assimilation. They gave us a new perspective on that. They gave us more on Seven of Nine. They added to her issues of insecurities. Mm-hmm. And the removal of the Borg implants, now we understand its purpose when it comes to Seven as a character. Mm-hmm. Picard and his idea, and the idea that he is dis- detached from emotion, or at least afraid to show emotion for some reason, that has come through as well. So the fact that, yes, they may be giving us similar things, that's, that's not the problem. The problem is what are you going to do with those similar things that you can exactly. claim for yourself? And yeah. they are doing that. They are giving that. us new things. Mm-hmm. Because if you want to complain about that, you might as well complain about Star Trek sequels. Well, oh, these are the same characters and they're on the same ship and they're fighting people. I mean, you can say that about anything. It's about what they do with it. What, well, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What do they do with it? As long as they progress the characters forward... That's okay. That's when nostalgia is done right. Yep. Okay, Dave. So final thoughts. I want to give this episode, I want to give it a 90%. I feel like it was a strong episode. I really do. And I, I hate that I'm (laughs) getting excited excited. and I hate that I'm Getting more confidence when it comes to the writing room, or I'm having more confidence in the writing room. Well, that's what that's what happens when you have a capable, culpable, or capable showrunner in Akiva Goldsman. Yeah, I mean, you don't have Michael Shaban. <laughs> you have Akiva Goldsman now. Yeah. So we'll see what happens. Overall, I'm very happy with the episode, and three episodes in, I can't complain. What about you, Dave? Uh, I'm actually identical with you. I'm, I I have this down as a 90 and, and it a very surprising 90 because like you, I'm very nervous <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> because I, I've been scorned before and I don't want to be scorned again. However, after this episode, I'm in, I'm on, I'm on board. I'm on board. I'm on the bandwagon. Oh, and I want to see where we're going. Um, none of the characters Irritate me. That's the thing that I wrote in my notes. After three episodes, I cannot look at a character and say, you know, you irritate me or you, I, I, I want you to die. Agnes is great. Remember in the, the, the beginning of the season one, I wanted Agnes to be dead. All of us did. <laughs> no one liked her last I wanted, year. I wanted Raffi to, to end up in a homeless shelter oh, somewhere. Oh, wow. <laughs> I want her son to kill her. Yeah, I want her son to kill her because it's like that stuff. But Talk about, dude. So... Watch them fix that. Yeah. Because that was a, a weird, that's a plot hole. It's like, where did that go? What was the point of that? It served no purpose. Actually, but if you think about it. this season 
will actually remedy that plot hole because of her relationship with Elnor. Exactly. If you think about it, the way that we got that in one episode was the son didn't want anything to do with her Mm -hmm. and tossed her out of his life. So that was treated like a traumatic experience for Rafi. And then you bring it to the new season where she gets a second chance with Elnor. And yeah. she it, looks at Elnor as like that adopted son. I can do mm-hmm. better. I can, mm-hmm. I can, I can fix this. And, and then and, she loses it. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, and let's say he comes back this season somehow. I'm sure they'll use it as a way to fix that plot hole, to, to draw those parallels, possibly even overtly mention it. But if they don't, I don't even think they necessarily need to, I don't because need I to. feel like an observant viewer will understand exactly what they're doing. Exactly. So 90% from you, 90% Mm -hmm. from me. So that's easy. That's a 90% 90%. across the board for the show as well. So I want to thank everyone for listening. This does bring us to the end. I want to remind people to find us on Patreon. If you go to patreon.com slash Rayman Digital, you can pledge $5 or more a month, and you'll gain access to our behind-the-scenes tier as well as our podcast tier. And with those options, you'll get all of our pre-shows as well as all of our additional discussions we do, which has to be close to thousands of hours at this point over the last several years. So once you subscribe, you will gain access to all of our past shows as well as things that we do in the future. And we have quite a bit planned for this year coming up. Patreon.com slash Rayman Digital Pledge is the only way we can keep doing shows. We need the support of the listeners. Thank you, David. Thank you. Live long and prosper.